Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Apex Podcast. As always, I am your host, Jan Almasy, and today I am joined by my co-host and partner in crime on another segment of the show that you might recognize, the disruptor, Mr. John Coots. John, how's it going, brother? I'm great, buddy. How are you? I am fantastic. I am so excited for this episode today. It's going to be a little bit different for everybody listening. This is an episode that we are going to take our standard mantra a little bit off track. It's still going to be ordinary people accomplishing extraordinary things, but me and John both have a little bit of personal investment in this episode because for those of you that don't know, I'm Slovak and John is something over there <laughs> in that same area. And we'll explore that a little bit more as we get yeah, we'll, into the episode. We'll, 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 we'll enlighten a little bit on mine and David's ethnic confusion, as we like to call it. Yeah, that, that'll make a lot more sense as the episode progresses. But as John just said there, we have a third person here with us, um, for those of you that are listening, by the name of David. And John, I would love to allow you to make that introduction since he is your family. Our guest today, and actually we were prepping for a, another interview on the disruptor theme, and we decided to have a little segment or segue into our family history. And so on the phone is my uncle, my dad's brother, David Kuntz, who is in his own right an ordinary person who does extraordinary things. He's written a number of books. He's run a very successful family practice and counseling practice. Part of what we want to do today is capture some of this knowledge of our, our family history. And one gentleman, or my great-grandfather and, and David's grandfather, Theodore Kuntz, who really wasn't an ordinary person who accomplished extraordinary things. So, David, why don't you uh, give a little better introduction of yourself and your background, and, and then I'll, I'll tell a little story on sort of how we brought you into this. Picture. Yeah, great, John. Great to be with both of you. Okay, yeah, I'm from Cleveland originally and went out west in the 1960s as a Catholic priest and spent 20 years in the Diocese of Idaho serving as a priest, and then a couple of years of that also in South America, in Cali, Colombia. Came back, then shortly after that left ministry, got retrained out here in California, in Berkeley, at the Graduate Theological Union, and began a private practice as a family psychotherapist. Did that for 20 years. In the meantime, wrote several books, as John mentioned, in the areas of popular psychology, and spirituality. And I am now retired. The focus of our conversation today is the place of origin of, our, of my grandfather and John's great-grandfather, Theodor Kuntz, which is Medziv, Slovakia, or historically, Metzenseifen. Recently, I was looking at Metzenseifen's website, and I realized from the time the town was founded like in the early or no it was the late 13th century there are dozens of names for this place and every one is a little bit different but that you can find a family resemblance in all the names and the most current one of course is Metsev Slovakia which leads of course John into our family confusion do you want to exactly. say something about that <laughs> So it's funny, but that's why we're calling this the confusion. I, I gave a presentation a while back called, why can't I find the city where my family is from? It starts before World War, when our, my great grandfather, David's grandfather, emigrated to the United States. From what I could tell David, the region was part of the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And as it was explained to me, the Germans came over the Carpathian Mountains and settled in what we always learned was Metzenseifen. And therefore, they spoke German, but were technically Hungarian because of the the, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. Right. The reason Jan and I got speaking is at one point, Jan, you were traveling to Toronto, and we were talking on the phone, and you were going across the border. This is back mm -hmm. before things shut down. And you were said you were headed to, and i always going to mispronounce because my Slovakian is not very good, or Slovak. Koshi, is that how you say it? Koshice. 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 That's pretty close. It just takes me a while. So you were headed there. I looked on a map and I go, holy cow, Koshice is only like 35 kilometers from Metzenseifen. So mm -hmm. that's how we got this whole thing going. And now I'm starting to realize, okay, yeah, so we are part of 
the Slovak Republic. And you have Poland to the north and Hungary to the south and the Czech Republic and Australia to the west and the Ukraine and, and, the, and Russia to the, to the east. I have been trying to resolve this ethnic confusion for the last few years. David, you were one of the last, actually, I think you certainly are the only one, maybe the only one in your generation. I don't believe anybody in, in my generation has traveled to Medzev. Right. And I, I know you, you did, and that's part of why I wanted to capture some of that recollection. Yeah, um, gladly. And we also have a connection, Jan, to Kosice. And I might just mention that quickly. And that is my uncle Theodore, who was my grandfather Theodore's oldest surviving child. So my uncle Ted, we called him. He went to school in Kosice. And I looked up the school. It was something like the Kershaw Academy. And I couldn't find any reference to it. But he was sent there from Lakewood, Ohio to Kosice to go to, I think it was high school. I think it was a Catholic boys high school. And he went there with Father William Kuntz, who was Theodore's cousin, I believe. He eventually left the priesthood, married, and had a couple of kids whom my older relatives have been in touch with. So anyway, that's a a slight but interesting connection to Kosice. Yeah, okay. My partner, Bob, and I went to visit Slovakia in 2008. Let me give you a little background how we got there. There's a man by the name of Heinz Schlüschner who lives in Berlin. And he is the administrator and the operator of the Metzenseifen website. And he put me in touch with Karol and Valeria Flakbart. Now, Valeria Flakbartova, I think they say, is the mayor, was the mayor, mm-hmm. and still is the mayor of Metzen. And Karol is a scientist. He studies temperatures and some very esoteric kind of science in Kosice. He's a serious physicist. I looked him up this morning to see serious. if I could get some background. I'm a scientist by training, and what he was publishing and what I read today was like right over my head. Wonderful people. And they gave Bob and me this wonderful tour of Medicine's Eye. And we figured we'd go there, rent a car, and drive around and look and see if we could find a gravesite or something. But with this introduction Hmm. through Hans Schlüschner and Karo Flakbart and Valeria Flakbartova, who was the mayor, we were treated like royalty, the favorite son's relative. So we were given lunch and a tour of the mayor's office and the brought to the hammers, which are the traditional industry of Metzenseifen, and just treated just Hmm. one. So it was a really magnificent experience. And I finally resolved our ethnic confusion, John. When Theodore came to this country in 1852, I believe he told most people when asked that he was German. And that was because he had this intense identity with the Germans all the way, I believe, from the 13th century. It was founded by Germans. And they kept that ethnic identity very strongly. So he said, that he was German. I believe that's what he did. Of course, I don't know. He died the year I was born, so I didn't know him. But I got that information through my father. We're German. No, we're not German. The name's German. The founding fathers of the town in the 13th century were German, and many immigrants who came since were German. But we're Slovak. We're Slovakian. Had he a passport today, it would be a Slovakian passport. So I hmm. probably say I'm Slovak Hungarian. I think you have to include the Hungarian because of that background of the empire. The ethnic confusion oh, yeah. is understandable, but now I think resolved. I think we get it. What I've also found is that many people who trace their roots back to this area have the same problem. It isn't I was going to say it. something that's really interesting about the way that you're explaining that is in modern day, when I was looking into Medzev and how to describe it geographically, in the modern context, what's really cool is that it's actually so Slovakia is divided up into regions, right? And then mm-hmm. we explain a little bit before the microphone came on that my cousin, Josef Yadab, is actually the bishop of the Spish region at Košicka or at Spiška Kapitula. 
And then Medzev, if you look at it in the context of the way they have that split up, it's actually a part of the region of Košice. And then it's oh. listed, I think, as its postal area is Košice na Okoli, which means essentially on the outskirts of Košice. Okay. Okay, yes. So there's there's the actual Košice, the city, and then there's Sadi na Torisu, which is where Zdoba and Bister and all of my mom's villages are located. And then there's Košice na Okoli, which is like the outermost circle of that area, and Medzev fits right inside of Košice in na there. Okoli. Okay, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're both still apart. You guys are a little bit further out of the concentric circles, but we're, we're all still a part of the same county, essentially. When we visited, they brought us into the church there, which is, I forget the name of the, the church. But as we walked into the church, over, over the high altar, there's that big baldacchino over the altar. And printed in Latin over the altar was, this church was renovated in 1931 by Theodore Kuntz. And so there was hmm. no doubt about that. Everyone who went to Mass there every day saw his name. And so it, it became very clear to us that he was one of their celebrated, yeah, there's the church, yeah, in the foothills of, of the Carpathians, yeah. Beautiful little church. Beautiful. It's a Mary Queen of Angels Church. And it's, Mary uh, Queen of Angels. Pretty much, you can, you can see it. It's up here in this upper, I was watching, oh, yeah. and yeah. it's way up. It's always in, it's very tall. It's probably the tallest building in, in the village. That's very you know, popular it, in a lot of the Slavic cities, is that the church steeple is one of the... The highest fun fact speech is actually one of the only areas where the church steeple isn't the highest thing in the area and it's because when the king built spishka hrad on top of the mountain he had to build mm -hmm. it on the mountain that was one step up from the monastery so uh -huh. speech the region is one of the only ones where the castle is actually higher than the church steeple yeah that would be rare one of the uh, enjoyments we had from our trip uh, to this area was in, in um, Budapest. My grandfather was part of a group of uh, citizens, I think maybe international group of citizens, to erect a, a statue of George Washington in Budapest. And so we, we were told that it was in a park in Budapest, and that's all we knew. So we went into Varosli, Varoslicet. I'm not sure I'm saying that. It's a great, huge park in the middle of Budapest and searched for it for several hours until we finally found the statue of George Washington. And there it was, big as life. And my grandfather, one of the things, when I say that he said that he was German, he was also very dedicated to Hungarian causes. In fact, he helped build the Hungarian Center in Cleveland. And he it helped erect the statue of George Washington in Budapest. So he also identified as Hungarian, but the language was always German. My father spoke a little German, but he didn't have a word of Hungarian. That was the strength of yeah, that. None of us knew any Hungarian growing up. No, yeah. no, not at all. If you run into people in Cleveland today and they recognize our last name, the ones that do 100% call themselves Hungarian descendants. And it's actually one of the reasons there's such a big Hungarian population in the city of Cleveland is Absolutely. because Theodore uh, was looking for workers and he helped bring people over to work in his factory. He was a, a cabinet maker and made sewing machines, cabinets and bicycle rims and church furniture and school furniture. And at one point even made automobile bodies when they were made out of wood. That's right. Which actually leads me into a, a, an interesting question, David, and, and that you may have, not, I don't know if you've contemplated it, but Medzeb or Metzensiphon is not known for cabinet makers. It's not. It's known more for blacksmiths, for lack of a better word. Yeah, the hammers, the and... hammers. They took us to the hammers. We, had, we made a visit to the hammers and the man who re runs the hammers came out and put them into operation for us. This was the extent they went to to be welcoming to us. And yes, so I was also having the same question, John, that you had. Why wasn't our grandfather or, or great-grandfather, why wasn't he in the metallurgy business? On the website, it also says that there was a, a workshop run by a man by the name of Tischler who did wood joining and carpentry. So I'm convinced that our okay. ancestors must have learned carpentry from them. 
But that was definitely the second most important industry in, in Ritz and Zyphon. Yeah. In that website entry, it said they made coffins and they made desks and they made furniture and anything made from wood. So when Theodore came to this country, he knew wood. That's what he knew was woodworking. And of course, that's what his company went on to make anything made of wood. All kinds of yeah. wood. Buildings in Cleveland, the, the courthouse. In fact, I, John, I don't know if you knew this, but the original Cleveland Stadium on the lakefront, all yes. the seats in that stadium were made by the Theodore Kuntz Company. So he was very yeah, good, I, hmm. well, well trained in woodworking. I actually have a brochure that I was able to find advertising the fact that the old municipal stadium in Cleveland, that whatever it was, 81,000 seats were all from the Theodore Kunz Company. The Theodore Kunz Company. Yeah. yeah. At one time, he was, I think, the, the largest employer in Cleveland. At one time. That, that was my recollection as well. There's a story I have about Hungarian people in Cleveland. Make a long story short, when I was home from a summer vacation from college, my mother asked me to take a chair down to Buckeye Road to have it reupholstered. So I brought the chair down and, and the reupholsterer was saying, are you, I'm in a very heavy accent. Are you related to Theodore Kuntz? And I said, yes, he's my grandfather. Oh my God. He went on and on about how wonderful he was. And he worked for him and his father worked for him. And he said, as a memento, I'll give you this letter opener. And it was a letter opener that had the Theodore Kuntz seal on it. And I still have it and treasure it. And he said, but uh, please give me, find me another letter opener. So I went out to a Woolworths drugstore and got this crummy old plastic letter. I was just a kid. What did I know? And so I gave it to him and he looked at it and said, okay, you can have it. So yeah, he was very well known wow. in Cleveland at that time. In fact, his, his picture was on the rapid transit. You remember seeing that, John? Yeah. So yeah, these, good. I've got a couple of these letter openers that are, we've been able to dig up. Good. Uh, yeah. Cool. Keep them. Good things. But yeah. Have. I'm curious. So he, it said that he had 10 children. Yes. That's a Several large died. family. Yeah, a lot, very large family. In fact, he was originally married to Agnes. And I don't know Agnes's last name. And she was barren. And so they divorced. And he remarried mm -hmm. his, his wife, Maria Balash who is also from Metzen Siphon, but I don't believe, I don't believe Maria was born there. I think she was born in Cleveland, but from Metzen Siphon. And they went on to have 10 children. The first one, Josie, died in infancy. The second one was Theodore, who was, who I mentioned, went to school in Kosicha. And then there they are. Yeah, to, from Dorothy, my father Ewald, Marie, Angie, and Angie, who lived out here in Carmel, Uncle Leo, my godfather, and Aunt Irene. Yeah. And when you look at the, those people, they're, they're not German. <laughs> they're, they have this very what down, the, or down to earth peasant quality to them. They're big people. They're not little Aryan, blonde haired Germans at all. No, they're Slovak. Slavs, and, baby. Yeah, it's funny looking at those names because um, I have an Aunt Dorothy. My dad or my grandfather's sister was Aunt Irene. We is that right? We have an Angie in our family. I swear on yeah. everything, man. We have the same. <laughs> yeah. We have even the same names. <laughs> yeah, and Leo was Leo was Leopold, not anything else. And Ewald from Ewald from the forest. Mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It's been one of the challenges in trying to put the history together because everybody kept renaming everybody the same names. And sometimes That's even right. in the same generation, they would be the same names. And then and our great-great-grandfather was Michael Kunt. The name was changed when yep. he came to this country. I don't know if it was when he came into the country or later. I'm not sure when the name was changed. But there's several spellings of that name. Often it's K-U-N-T-Z. In other many, there's many different spellings of it. One of the things we really enjoyed in our visit to Metzenzeifen was a visit to the cemetery. And so many names are 
just there. And then we saw that uh, my, my great grandparents, uh, grave there and it was really very emotional cemetery in was the cemetery there were they above ground um, or were they in ground my recollection jan is that they were both i think mostly in ground but uh, as i stone from my great grandparents was quite large i remember that was larger than I expected it to be. I don't know why, but it was. And uh, but I think it was both. Oh, see. Yeah, they do point? look a lot below ground. Yeah, here's a quick picture from the cemetery well, that awesome. I was able to dig up years ago. And yeah, it does look like there's some above ground and and some mm -hmm. below ground. Yeah. The only reason I ask is because in my families in Koshitsa, when somebody passes away over there. It's a whole, like the whole, entire village gets involved because everybody's so intimately connected. It's my, my parents grew, or my mom grew up in a town where there's maybe 30 houses, which is good and bad, but <laughs> <laughs> they would have the, these like ceremonies because you could walk to the church and then you can walk from the church to the cemetery. And I guess mm -hmm. the ground specifically around that region of Koshitsa is not very conducive to being in ground. So the entire cemetery oh. where our family is buried is all these massive granite slabs that are oh. above the ground and headstones that are, ma are huge. And they're yeah. way bigger than I would have ever expected. It's okay, very ornate over there compared to here. Yeah, so we had a similar experience with that. Yeah. Uh -huh. the, the other thing that came up for us in our visit was the presence of the Roma people in that area. And they have also always been, I think, historically a huge challenge for all of the world. But one of the things that Valeria Flakbartova initiated was a program to give employment to Roma people, which I thought was really uh, a, a neat thing. And she had them, uh, I, I forget exactly what the details of the industry was, but to give them work, to keep them out of the trouble that they normally get into with uh, governments and authorities. So I was really, I really admired her for trying to really do something positive about that particular challenge in the area. Did they call for the Romani or the Roma people? Did they ever use the word Ciganka or Cigani? Ciganer. I remember the word Ciganer from my youth, but I don't think so. Do I. Do you remember, John? Yeah, there's this, oh, yeah. This, this tradition in our family. There's, they must have been Hungarians. I don't know where they were from. Mm. Maybe they were from Metzenzeifen, but they were musicians. And I think, were they Roma people, John? Were they? Well, oh, they were always gypsies. Gypsies, yeah. which is not a very favorable term, I don't think, to use. No. But I think they were Roma people. And I think they were uh, musicians and they would come every Christmas and serenade Christmas. our family mm -hmm. with this gypsy mu music. And it was, it was a big deal well, in our family. John, you remember? Oh yeah. I remember explicitly every, we'd always go to our grandparents, father and mother, my grandparents on Christmas Eve and every year for years, years. even on two, two different houses. These guys would show up and they would be at four or five of them. And one would have a, a violin or another might have a cello or another guy a big bass. bass. And a big and, bass. Right. And they, yeah, I remember the big bass and they would sing and they do a couple songs. And, and I believe they also went to uh, Uncle Leo's house. I think they went to Leo's house as too, well. Yeah. yeah. And whoever they yeah. could find. But I remember them. Yeah. And we used to call yeah. them the Saginers, which Saginers. I so the, can you use the word though, that's a slightly different. Is it a similar root? I bet. Yeah. It's Igani. I think it with the way that it Cigani. came over the way that you guys are saying it maybe is like a slightly filtered Americanized version Probably. or it's just a conglomeration of the other, because it almost sounds like when I was a kid, my grandfather went to a church called Sacred Heart Parish here in Canton, Ohio, and mm -hmm. it was all Slovak people. They all came over here. They all worked at Republic Steel. They all lived in the same neighborhood. The Slovak oh. club was right down the street from the Polish club, and okay. it was everything like that. And they had this group called the Slovak Singers, and we would sing Cigani music. Cigani. And it was like that, like a gypsy a mixture between a gypsy music and a polka essentially that's the kind of music i remember that was it very fast paced and 
r- rhythmic, yeah. And so they would dance fun. around a little they bit. Dance. It was wonderful. It, it was a wonderful tradition. It was cool. It, I remember it explicitly. It was always mm-hmm. like, here they come. I'm wondering if it's just none of us knew actually how to pronounce the word correctly. So I, think, yeah, I think I think Jan's right about that. I think it's an Anglicized yeah. uh, <laughs> mispronunciation. <laughs> It's the Hungarian, German, English, Latin <laughs> translation. But almost it sounds like the my the blue collar side of my family. So half of them moved and were at the Republic Steel, and the other half were coal miners in West Virginia. And it sounds like that might be the part of the family's like, oh, here come the Saginers. One of the things I want to mention is the wonderful reception that we received in Medziv, Metzenzeifen from the Flockbarts. These are really wonderful people. And uh, I think that, that Jan, do you know, is she still the mayor of Metsev? Looked it up in preparation for this and she uh, was not reelected or didn't run, but there yeah. is a new mayor, I think as okay. of 2018, I believe. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense because yeah. she was mayor for a long time. And Carl, they were just, uh, we keep in touch every now and then by email. And recently when the Pope visited Slovakia, we had a couple emails back and forth and they're just wonderful people. And if anybody has a plan to visit, if any family members have a plan to visit Metzenzeifen, be sure to get in touch and I'll give you a contact for, for the Flockbarts. They're wonderful yeah, people. Yeah, we'll I'm going to flash up a picture here. Here, here, you, here yeah. you and Bob are in, yeah. the, in her office. Yes. And I, I did a little research on those flags behind her because I flags as you can see behind me i'm i like uh-huh. flags intrigue me so uh, obviously one is the eu flag right i'm guessing the one in the middle is the, uh, the slovak flag and then the one on the right behind her is the Metzenzeifen. town of metzenzeifen's flag i think that's right yeah she was just a, a charming and she gave medcoa the key to the city it, it's just a minute can you see this oh wow it's just a- it's a spike. It's a curve. It's, an, I, it's a curve yeah. spike. There's Obviously the came out of the iron or the hammer or the fashion, whatever they call it. The yeah. And she presented it. I keep it right here on my desk. She presented it as a key to the city. In that, in, in the picture there, that plate with the orange cake, mm-hmm. it's got orange going through the middle. That's very typical, she said, of Metzenzeifen, of, of Metzev. I tell you, they were so gracious it's just hard to say and then i also asked them i said with bob and i visiting i said what's it like for gay people in slovakia and she said oh it's totally cool no problem at all part of that is because they're part of the european union and the other thing is that i think they're probably a lot more understanding than some of the people in that area so i think it's still a little bit iffy over there for gay folks but certainly getting much better it definitely depends on what region I would think it's similar to the way the U.S. maybe lays itself out, that you get yeah, a little bit further into the uh, into the Carpathian Mountains and it goes backwards in time slightly. Yeah, yeah. I think that's true all over the world, isn't it? That is a really cool. That spike is awesome. I, I love isn't how it? one thing that I've always loved about Slovak culture and the only – I always mess with my co-founder is hardcore Italian, and I always mess with mm. him, and I say the only people that might be able to outhost an Italian is a Slav. Because when you show up, you would think like when I first came back, I didn't see my grandparents for five or six years because I was in the military. Oh. And when I came back, you would have thought that the Messiah returned to Zdoba. We came back. The neighbors yeah. were all waiting at my grandparents' house. We went down and every single house had kolachi and shots of Shlivovitz. And by the time I made it back to my parents or back to my grandparents' house, I had no issues falling asleep. Yeah, <laughs> waking yeah. up the next morning but it was there's it's always inspired me especially being in business and entrepreneurship where things can be so fast paced all the time how gracious i am to be so closely connected to a culture that is so good at grounding themselves and just Amen. being in a moment with each other it's yes. beautiful yeah and that's so well said and that totally was our experience there that's why i keep emphasizing how embracing they were, how welcoming they were. One of the other things we did when we were there was visit our relatives, Kinga. Kinga and her husband, Stefan. And Kinga is related to that uncle that I mentioned, Uncle William, who was a priest, then married and had kids. They live in, in the Buddha part of Budapest. And we went there and had dinner with them, and they made us Hungarian goulash, and they 
the kids were just wonderful and they gave us, we walked in the door and they had glasses and a bottle of Schlivovitz. How do you say that? Is mm -hmm. that what it is? Of Schlivovitz? Close. Schlivo, Schlivovitz. Schlivovitz. And of course, there we go. We drank it, but, but I, I don't, I hate them. <laughs> but we drank it and they were just so enthusiastic. And, and I, I, it was very warming, very warming. They didn't have to do that for us. They, they didn't know us from heaven. Mm. Mm. I actually nicer. had a really, I had a really cool conversation with my grandfather when I was over there. And mm. this may be something I'm, I'm really curious about two, two questions. And so I'll use this story to explain both. So my grandfather, he was a, a steel worker that would have to travel back and forth to Russia because he was an engineer. Mm. And so he would work in the engineering plants. We were sitting there having a conversation the one night, bottling up some Slivovitz because he makes his at home and I needed to bring some bottles back to the U.S. Otherwise, my mom would not invite me back <laughs> into the home. Um, <laughs> but we had a really deep conversation about how he... I basically asked him, why are we such good hosts? Like, why is it so important? You're teaching me all of these things about taking care of people. You're teaching me all of these things about making sure that you have gifts, making sure that you have good liquors, making sure that you have good food. Why is that such a large piece? And he said that he could proceed to tell me stories about how he remembered after the war that Slovakia was left completely economically crippled and they were mm -hmm. on the barter system. They uh -huh. had no currency. They had nothing. He was, if you didn't know how to make shoes, you didn't have shoes. If you didn't know how to raise a chicken to trade for a piece of clothing because you didn't know how to sew. Right. It right. Was, so he said that the whole reason why he believes that the culture is still so prominently that way and they all care about each other so much is because it's not that long ago that the only way that you survived yeah. was on relationships mm -hmm. with your neighbors. So and they have a deep I, appreciation. A very deep appreciation. And I've always taken that with me where it's maybe that's where a lot of that gratitude or that it's maybe it's not gratitude. It's like vivaciousness for life. Life yes. just yes. invigorates them. And yes. that 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 comes from this deep appreciation for your neighbors and yes. that value that community brings. And so that would be my two part question is one. Did you, obviously you've experienced that type of feeling in Medzev, but pretty much everywhere you went, would you say that was echoed? Yes. And then the second half is I'm curious about, because my dad is Roman Catholic and my mom is Byzantine, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is there a, what was the religious context of, of Theodore and that part of the family as they came over? Are they Catholic, Orthodox, or what did that landscape look like? That, the first part of the question is, yes, I did encounter that same vi vivacity and, and just genuine welcome and appreciation based on memories of hard times. And I'm also very grateful to have grown up in a family that, that exhibited that and found, found those same values. Yeah, I would concur. That value has gone through our family. Since, it has, John. Has as been. long as I can remember. Come in. You're welcome. Have a drink. Sit, make yourself at home. In regard to religion, they were very definitely Roman Catholic. Um, mm. The family was very practicing, very believing, and my aunts and uncles, even into their old age, were very practicing Catholics. Of all the children, however, it's interesting, I would say my father was probably the least dedicated Catholic. He was, he was very definitely Roman Catholic, and, but had, had an attitude that I've always appreciated which was take it too seriously. <laughs> if you can get pretty severe in, in religion, can get pretty severe. So I always appreciated the edge he, he gave us about that. My mother, on the other hand, was very, she had a heavy dose of Irish and German from her family. So she was also, oh, yeah. A, a but yeah, my father probably the least gung ho, would you say, in, in regard to that, but they were definitely Roman Catholic and, and practicing. I noticed that growing up with all the relatives, my grandparents, your parents, you were the few people that were allowed to go to non Catholic schools, right? You guys were able to go to university exactly. schools. We went to US and yeah. Other where everybody of our, your generation and pretty much my generation had to go to a Catholic you know, high school. Gilmore, Ignatius, or. Right. 
somewhere, right? And they were definitely open to exploring certainly yes. from the educational Yeah, perspective. that was my dad. That was my dad much more than my yeah. mom. Yeah, for sure, which I've always appreciated, yeah. We should wrap this up. Unless you've got other questions, John or David, you have anything else to, you cover the things that oh, I was I, curious about. I really okay. was, wanted to explore this ethnic confusion that we, yeah, we, okay. we can kid ourselves I think we, about. I think we I, got the ethnic that. confusion. You've definitely got Jan and I putting on our bucket list. We're going over there one of these days. Oh, I hope so. And be sure, to, the, be sure to look up no, the connections I, I mentioned. I will. We will do that. And one last commercial. So this is a, oh, really a part one of an interview. The part two is going to be in a few weeks where we're going to talk to David again under the disruptor mantra and it's a little bit of a plug for the next one. Oh, your new book, David, called The Art of Stopping. We're going to spend some time talking about how, the, how to survive disruption through the art of stopping. I think it'll be another great conversation in a, in a couple of weeks. I'm definitely looking forward okay. to that conversation as well. And then okay. you think Thank about you the way that we're en wrapping this and the topic that we ended on was this tenacity and vivaciousness towards life and grabbing it, those moments as they, they fly away. Like my grandmother always used to say that, oh, what's the phrase? Bohas duch neya velmi dulha na zemi, which basically means that the breath of God doesn't stay on earth for very long that it, it's fleeting it hits you and then it it runs away and so that it's your job or to be aware of when it enters and then be grateful for the fact that it's there and just be immersed in that moment to the point where she still sets an extra plate at the table for jesus and we're singing really? uh, or we're saying our prayers in slovak and there's that extra seat but that familial bond is something that I was really intrigued to see if you guys both reflected because mm -hmm. that's when I was talking to my parents over the weekend that's what we all settled on is that the, our favorite part mm -hmm. about being Slovak is how tightly bonded ours is our family so yes. it's, it's amazing yeah. to know that across generations across different regions or ethnic confusions and whatever that that region as a whole is just wholesome to use the phrase that we used earlier, maybe a little bit peasant-like people mm -hmm. that are just so yes, yes. deeply Down appreciative of the simple things. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's totally. what I'm really looking forward to exploring in the book is maybe it's, I've read through, I believe it's a previous version that I have, but it's the one with the book Basically cover. Basically the same. And so I've, yeah. I've yeah, read through that one and I've gotten a lot of those types of mentalities coming through the words of the page why it's so important to be able to stop. And it's been beautiful to have this conversation as a preface to this next one. So everybody that's listening, if you want a little bit more in depth on th that type of concept and, and these pieces that it will allow you to really grab a hold of those moments and appreciate life as you're moving through, especially now with how quickly everything seems to be moving, I highly recommend listening to the next yeah. episode. Thank you so much, well, both of you. Thank, and Yannick, thank you, David. Real, real it's always pleasure. good to chat with you. Thank you. It's been a Anytime. pleasure to meet you. Okay. All right. See you next time, everybody.